costumes are there to help us recognize our favorite heroes, to help inspire those who see them, and to make our heroes honestly look good. But sometimes they do just the opposite. I was thinking about including Green Arrow on this list, but then I thought of something even better. Someone who has a getup that even Green Arrow's original Robin Hood look cannot hold a candle to. Get ready for... Hawkeye in his purple pantless number. Now complete with his fancy headband. Admittedly, this was a costume that Hawkeye donned upon his return to the circus, or at least a return to the circus, but still, my goodness, what a look. It feels like a bit of a play on Robin Hood, but of course in Hawkeye's classic purple and without any pants or tights for that matter. Just him in a very deep v-neck tunic here. Oh, and with purple riveted metal looking bracelets. It's honestly quite the look. Needless to say, it didn't last too long. Oh boy, this one isn't just wild because of the look of the outfit, it's wild because of the retcon that came along with it. How do I explain? Well, during New 52, Starfire basically lost her memories and ended up finding, kissing, and teaming up with Jason Todd's Red Hood and his team of outlaws. Although she and Jason were thankfully not made an item, she and Arsenal uh, kind of were. How do you feel about Arsenal and Starfire together? Who do you ship Starfire with anyways? Or who do you ship Arsenal with? What is your your favorite comic book ship in general? Let me know in the comments. Anyways, to go along with her very free love attitude here, Starfire sported a very tiny costume. Now granted, Starfire has been implied to be somewhat powered by the sun, or sometimes I think she she's absorbed sun energy. It's not consistent, but it's been a thing here and there. And she's also no stranger to wearing something akin to a bathing suit in terms of her costume. She also comes from a world where, you know, this attire is more custom, she's more used to it, it's what she's comfortable in, which honestly Honestly, is fine and makes sense for the character in most cases. But this took that idea of her being, you know, more scantily clad to an extreme, with her wearing something smaller even than a bikini. And of course, with the bonus of her losing some of her agency in terms of how she dressed since she was struggling with her memory at the time. So she wasn't entirely herself here, which, you know, makes this costume feel a little, a uh, little icky. I have to say, I never expected to see Havoc dressed this way. I think you know what I'm about to talk about, because it's also one of my favorite looks for both Madeline Pryor and Alex Summers. Even though it's ridiculous, we're talking about the Goblin Prince. I think one of my favorite things about this weird getup is how tattered it looks on everyone. Like, what are people getting up to in this that they're so tattered? Is Limbo full of rough edges or protruding edges that you just, like, constantly are getting your costume hooked onto? I need to figure out what is happening happening here. But I have to say, honestly, I love it. That being said, I also think the iconic shininess of this black look is great. And that's how I've always seen it, as shiny and polished in my mind. But we have to also admit that yes, this costume is super ridiculous. And the fact that Havoc got a matching look to Maddie is super weird. It's super ridiculous for sure. But you know, hey, at least it's a quality. At least Maddie's wearing it and so is Alex. They're wearing it together as a unit. Speaking of unconventional looks, next up we also have another daring black number. This one comes to us from DC Comics, and it is none other than Cosmic Boy. Cosmic Boy, for some reason, did not have anything that they were wearing that resembled space at this time, or anything cosmic. They instead were wearing a black kind of corset with a deep v-neck attached to booty shorts, black gloves, and black booties. It's just such an iconic and eye-popping look, honestly. Although I guess this was the 70s, so maybe this is what everyone was wearing back then? I don't know. I wasn't alive in the 70s, so if if this was you and you were sporting this look and you were rocking it, please let me know because honestly, I I probably would wear this look today and I think maybe this is a look we should bring back. What does Cosmic Boy even look like today? Oh, that's what he looks like. At least it's striking. The modern day look for Cosmic Boy just kind of looks boring to me. Maybe we should just bring back this look actually, just do that instead. The sad truth for our next point is that this is a character who's never really had a great look. Sadly, the look that he has now is one of the looks that he's had for honestly the longest time and it's because it's the best of what I would say is kind of the worst of costumes. That's right, we're talking about Wonder Man here. Poor Wonder Man. Poor Simon. The disrespect that we have shown him in terms of the costumes that we've dressed him in. It's just sad. He's such a cool character and yet he usually has honestly such dumb looks. This is a particularly dumb one though. We're talking about the West Coast Avengers costume, the orange and blue number that he wore when he was on the West Coast Avengers. It's kind of got like a W on it that goes down into like the shape of an X sort of as well. There's like these big 
yellow pieces on the back. I don't know what's happening with this look, but I'll tell you what it is. It's not a good look. And needless to say, it was very short lived, which is saying something about someone like Simon, who, like I said, is used to wearing some pretty bad costumes, honestly. Oh boy, this next look is very iconic because it's very different from anything that we would see this character wear. We're talking about Batman here. And I think if you know Batman's costume history, you maybe know what I'm about to say next. We're talking about the rainbow suits. Honestly, I love how colorful these are, but that's what makes them so weird and unique is the fact that Batman is usually known for dressing in pretty dark colors, usually black, sometimes blue, sometimes Sometimes a, a bit of bright yellow peppered in here or there, but not usually rainbow. We don't get a whole range of colors with Batman normally. That being said, this time we did, and even better, this wasn't just a change because Batman wanted to like try something new, or he thought, hey, this is super fashionable. This was a change that actually served a purpose in the comics. There's a reason for it. What was the purpose here? Distraction. That's right, this was a distraction tactic. Batman used this to protect his sidekick, his ally, the boy wonder, Robin. Honestly, I gotta say, I think it would work pretty well for me. I'm used to seeing Batman dressed in pretty dark colors, so if he just came out in like a bright orange suit, I would be like, wait, what is happening? Who is this guy? I don't know where to look. Is that Batman? Is he okay? I wouldn't even notice the boy wonder myself. This next point might honestly get me into some trouble, I know, with some of you in the comments. It usually gets me in trouble when I talk about it, but I'm willing to take that. I'll, I'll take the trouble, give it to me. I know this is a controversial point, but we're gonna talk about Sue Storm's fantastic cutout costume. Now, I do know that there was a reason behind this costume, so yes, it was to showcase the fact that Sue was kind of different at this time because she was being possessed by her alter ego, Malice. Malice is basically like Sue Storm unhinged. It's like Sue Storm, if she just woke up and realized, you know what, maybe life isn't so good. Maybe my husband Reed is kind of a jerk. Maybe it's okay to be a woman and be mad. But also if she was just evil because that's that's really what Malice is all about now. And also the fact that, you know, Malice is, sometimes she's like Sue's alter ego, sometimes she's like another entity that possesses her. This is an evil entity and it's often presented as being, like I said, a sort of dark side of Sue Storm taking hold of her. And this costume change was meant to represent that change to Sue's psyche, which is obviously a lot more of an edgy look for Sue. This is not something we normally see her in. However, the fact that Malice is presented here as another entity, something that is both a part of Sue, but is also very separate from her, that takes control of her, means that this costume change also happened with like a little lack of agency, I would say. In my opinion too, this is kind of a weird change because Malice is like an evil side of Sue that like always has to be erased if it ever shows up. It wasn't a part of herself that she just reconciles with, which is ultimately why I don't like this look for her. I just think the whole malice thing is kind of weird and the way they dealt with it is kind of weird. I don't mind the sexy element for Sue. I think Sue could be sexy. I just like her to be the one that says, you know what, I'm going to be sexy today. I'm okay and I choose to be sexy. Not this evil half of her that has to be eliminated, you know, malice. For this next little number, we're going to the movie, specifically the Batman movie. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna talk about that look. We're gonna talk about the bat nipples. <laughs> can I say nipples? I think I can say nipples, so I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say nipples. This costume is just a lot, which is why it makes the cut. I don't think I need to say too much about it, so I'm just gonna leave it at that nipples. Moving back over to Marvel, every time I revisit this look for Professor X, it gets more ridiculous for me. Every time I learn more about it, I think, why does this exist? Who is this for? Is it really for Charles? Is it really for Lalandra? We're talking about the Shi'ar exoskeleton, or as I like to call it, the Shi'ar exosuit, but that's not an official term. I don't know if anyone else uses that term, just FYI, but that's what I like to say. The Shi'ar exosuit is one that was gifted to Charles by Lalandra Naramani, his love. It is made by the Shi'ar and allows those who are unable to walk the ability to walk using telepathic energy. There is a downside though. The telepathic energy that is required to basically pilot this suit makes you exhausted to the point that when Professor X joins his own X-Men in a fight against Magneto in Fatal Attractions, he literally needs Jean Grey to accompany him to even be able to walk with his X-Men in the exoskeleton. I'm sorry. But Charles, just leave the suit at home, my man. Don't wear the suit if it's going to limit you that much, especially if you're going up against Magneto. What were you thinking? Also, although I'm not sure if this comes up, it does look like it's made of some kind of metal. I don't think that's ever addressed, but I just mean, 
you know, get this man a glass wheelchair, get him a glass hover chair, get him anything else. Oddly enough, Charles did prefer to use his hover chair as opposed to using the exoskeleton, apparently. I understand, he's probably like mentally exhausted. Our final point is one that's new to me, and I just wanna say I'm so glad I found this out so that I could share it with you. Initially, I was going to talk about 90s Doctor Strange on this list. Admittedly, 90s Doctor Strange is a pretty weird look, but this, this is weirder, honestly. We're talking about 90s Doctor Fate. For some reason, Doctor Fate in this era had a host who decided he was just gonna basically reject Jack Naboo, reject the helm, and he melted it down to make a golden dagger. I'm sorry, what? I didn't even know that was an option. But hey, I guess it is. I guess, you know, you found a loophole. This has to be the edgiest Dr. Fate I have ever seen. And although it looks ridiculous, I am honestly so happy that it exists. Thank you for making my weird costume dreams come true. Some supervillains are recognized for their iconic fear-inducing costumes, and others are remembered for their more wacky and unhinged looks. <laughs> Crazy Quilt was a talented painter living a double life as a crime lord because, of course he was, he uses his paintings to leave clues for his henchmen about his various plans. He was double-crossed but fought back. However, in the confusion, fusion, his eyesight was damaged. Crazy Quilt desperately wants his vision back and undergoes experimental surgery. The surgery only partially worked. Worked. Quilt could now see, but only in very vivid colors. This drove him insane, and the crazy was added to his name. This is also when he first donned his iconic, colorful suit. I desperately hope this thing was actually made of quilting material. Imagine being a seamstress in this universe and receiving that request. The other part of his costume is the helmet with colorful lights on top. The helmet is where his powers come from. They include hypnosis, laser beams, and blinding lights. He would also sometimes use a more physical approach uh, to escaping his enemies. He would carry around paint and then throw it on them when he wanted to escape. Crazy Quilt, despite being driven mad, he is still very intelligent. In one universe, the New 52, he invented what he coined as the healing stitch. It unravels a cell's structure and then stitches it back together during the process, de-aging it. After one former football player was bounced out of pro ball, he decided to take on the job of a hitman in quite a peculiar outfit. Flying Tiger first made his way on panel in Spider Woman number 40, hired to end the web slinger. His amazing costume is a tiger suit with armor underneath it's equipped with blue wings so he can fly. It's a bit of an odd choice considering the average tiger is not able to fly. So where did the inspiration for a flying tiger come from? It's been suggested that it was inspired by a group of fighter pilots called the Flying Tigers. There is also a football team called the Memphis Tigers. Maybe he was a player. We don't know yet. We don't even know the character's real name. What we do know is that he isn't genetically enhanced in any way. He is about as strong as the average American football player. He is good at being a hitman. Before being defeated by Spider Woman, he had a 100% success rate. Up next is another animal themed villain that commonly faces Captain America, and he does it wearing a rooster suit. I wish I was kidding. His first appearance in Captain America 183. His suit of choice is blue with a red and orange rooster mask, talon light gloves, and red boots with paws attached. He pulls the look together with a red and orange tail feather ensemble. He looks great to say the least. Sorry, Gamecock has lived in Harlem and has worked under the crime boss Mr. Morgan for years, eventually leaving to participate in a competition called Blue. Blood sport. He doesn't last very long and is zoomed dead before turning up again as a retiree from villain life. He fights using the metal talons on his gloves and feet, as well as using his acrobat and martial arts training. His villain name is also a phrase, meaning a rooster that is trained for fighting. On brand, Dr. Spectro is on my list for my next game night. He is literally a walking twister mat. He doesn't even need to take the suit off. He can just lay down and pe let people walk all over him. That's what Captain Adam does anyway. The suit is black with lots of red and yellow dots and blue dots all over every inch. He also has these incredible red monoblock sunglasses and a red electric scooter hoverboard thing as his main mode of transport. This is the newer version of Dr. Spectro, but the original from the 60s was a light-powered scientist turned villain that originally started out with a striped costume, presumably to mimic light rays. He fought using color and light to create powerful energy rays. The spotted Spectro is a different guy that was mistakenly identified as Dr. Spectro, the previous one, by a reporter, and he just rolled with it. This guy's name is Tom Thomas Emery. In Thomas's universe, Spectro isn't actually a person. He is a fake villain the government created to cover up a secret project. Of course, Thomas made him very real and very chic. His powers are also very similar with power 
powerful light energy rays, but he can also manipulate light and color to create confusing illusions. Dr. Dome is a villain that met a pretty unfortunate fate after the multiverse collapsed during the crisis on Infinite Earths event of 1986. He was totally erased. Even his wacky costume wasn't enough to keep him in people's heads. Dome wore a metal dome on his head. It looks kind of like an upside down walk pot. He has a sometimes green, sometimes orange jumpsuit with yellow epaulettes on the shoulders, and his eyes are technically under the dome, but are always drawn on top. He has a very, very thin curled mustache on his face as well. He is an enemy to Plastic Man, and his name is suggested to be a parody of Doctor Doom from the Marvel comics. Eventually, Doctor Dome is brought back to life during the Dark Crisis rebirth of the multiverse in 2022 and 2023. Thank goodness, we missed him. Now here's the thing, when I look at the redesigns for Owl Man, I can believe he exists. He looks pretty menacing, and owls eat bats, so the owl part makes sense. However, the first design for this man in Justice League of America number 29, he deserves financial compensation for. It looks like he bought everything he's wearing a size too big. He has a cape that kind of looks like a bed sheet, the sock boot things, which were a common design of the time, and his actual suit is what looks like a loose ray onesie. The best part though that I'm so glad I get to share with you is his mask. It's a pretty brown owl head with two incredibly round massive eyes. It's beautiful. This character existed at a time when villains were drawn like their heroes so that readers knew exactly who was for who. In fact, Owlman is intended to be corrupt Batman. Batman's suit does fit better though, I guess billionaire can afford tailoring. The Owlman mount mantle is taken up by multiple people so he looks a lot more menacing as he goes. My favorite is the crime syndicate version. Like look at his cape, that's so cool. And his eyes are giving exactly what they need to get with all that glowing going on. Owlman is super smart, He has, but he does have limited mind control powers, he's a martial martial artist, and he has advanced healing. You can also catch him causing trouble on the screen as well as in the Lego Batman games. I also really like his fit there. Eric Morden, or Mr. Nobody, has got a pretty interesting look all on his own, but the most chaotic version of him lives in his team of chaos causers, the Brotherhood of Dada. The Brotherhood has costumes of all different colors and shapes, but one big thing in common, they are all outrageous. Mr. Nobody is pretty tame compared to everything else. He is uh, all black with a heart-shaped hole in his chest, sleepwalk, wears some striped blue pants, a high-collared blue shirt, missing the shoulders, and has black circles drawn on her eyes. The fog is just a cloud of death fog. Frenzy wears a very tall top hat and a blue suit shaped like a rectangle covered in various patterns, swirls, and colors. Quiz is head to toe neon green um, and kind of like a neon green yellow and covered in red question marks. He also has various silver tubes all over his body. Agent has green pants, a hot pink jacket, and what looks like a cage over his chest. He also has some pretty cool spiky hair too. The group commonly fought against and were foiled by Doom Patrol. I love this next fit. If I could steal one, it would be this one. Deimos is the son of Ares and an enemy to Wonder Woman. He is the god of terror, which is already iconic, but his hair is what helps him create the fear. It is made of live snakes that, if they bite you, cause overwhelming levels of terror. On top of his slithering locks is a helmet, also with snakes. His gloves are green and also made of snakes. He has a green style kilt, not made of snakes, and a studded belt. And some pretty incredible dinosaur looking boots. They are interesting to say the least. He also has access to something called the Helm of Serpents. Four enchanted snakes attack a victim from all sides, poisoning them. He is known for being calculating and manipulative. Joseph Meech has had quite the journey from high diver to custodian to composite Superman. Joseph had planned a pretty epic diving routine. Unfortunately, it was the kind of dive that could only be done once, if you know what I mean. Superman got Joseph back on his feet by not only saving him from the fall, but also getting him a job in the Superman Museum. Unfortunately, Joseph was a bitter person, and the anger he was feeling was transformed into a hatred of Superman. He was being bombarded by Superman's face every day, so. One night, the lifeless duplicates of the Legionnaires in the museum were struck by lightning, and poor Joseph happened to be standing right beside. But he gained the powers of all Legion members, including shape-shifting. This is what he used to create the costume that was half Batman and half Superman. But his really interesting choice is that he just decided to turn his skin green. Composite Superman continued to be a thorn in Superman's side until ultimately being destroyed by an energy blast. The suit was pretty cool though. And finally, we have to give this guy the time of day because he would do the same for us. This is Calendar Man. He is naturally obsessed with calendars and holidays and will literally theme his crimes around holidays or seasons. His civilian name is Julian Gregory Day, which if he was born with that name, that's a setup. He's literally named after Calendar. He was first introduced in Detective Comics 259 in 1958. Right off the bat, this man is giving us a full fashion collection. We have his summer look in which he is dressed like the sun. It is an orange suit that emits heat concentrated heat. Then we have a winter look, a snowman suit with a top hat 
sweatshirts, scarf, and mittens. Then for spring, he's created a suit resembling a daisy, complete with a petal necklace and daisy buttons. For fall, a sensible yellow mini dress with a tree on the front and red tights and cape. This is not even the most dedicated he's been to the bit. He lives in a satellite orbiting Earth that is filled with different types of calendars. This next time we see him, briefly, he's given up his eye for a super eye that shoots lasers and is also sporting eight new outfits. Where does he get them from? His final outfit of the issue is the one that ends up coming back and becoming his main look. It's a red and white suit with a cape made of calendar pages and a calendar sash belt. Later versions of him, like the one cameoed in the film Suicide Squad, have featured his prison jumpsuit look. You know it's him because he has tattooed the months around his head. One of the most fun parts of comic books and superheroes for me, and I'm sure a lot of you nerds out there, would have to be the superhero costume. This is where artists can really try all kinds of things for all kinds of characters. And some of the things they tried really took us off guard. For example, you know, a lot of suits of armor do all these crazy cool things, like being actually alive, or adapting wishes, or traversing the vacuum of space. But not for our first suit of the day, the Muramasa armor. Essentially, it had one main benefit, but despite that, it's probably the coolest armor I have ever seen. In the all new Wolverine series, X-23 gets her hands on this special suit of armor called the Muramasa armor. The word Muramasa may be familiar to you if you are a fan of Wolverine comics. The Muramasa blade was forged by the legendary swordsmith Muramasa by using a piece of Wolverine's own soul. It's the second blade made by Muramasa and it's extremely durable and capable of cutting through substances on the molecular level, even adamantium. More than that though, the sword is also capable of greatly reducing the efficiency of a superhumanly fast healing rate, meaning that the sword is the only thing on earth that can truly end the life of Wolverine or others like him. Well, this armor was made for Laura Kinney in order to protect from the broken Muramasa blade fragments that were being used against her. But other than its absolutely amazing look, the coolest thing about this armor is that it's made with soul fragments of Wolverine, Gabby, and Dokken. This thing basically became a Wolverine family heirloom. Now while the Muramasa armor is just absolutely awesome, this next suit is just straight up nonsensical. But that is why we love it. Tony Stark's virtual armor, or the Model 68, is probably the most unique of all of Iron Man's armors. The virtual suit first debuted in Iron Man 2020, Volume 2, Number 5, when Tony Stark had his consciousness pulled out of his body to save his life, and it resulted in the virtual armor, which was made from the resources of the, quote, 13th floor, which is basically a virtual reality built of solid light. Now just to preface, I never said any of this had to make sense. The virtual armor being virtual and made of solid light could allow Tony to create any tool that he could possibly think of. It augmented his strength, it somehow actually protects against weapons fire, and it's invisible by default, acting as almost a force field around Tony that no one can see unless he wants it to be so. What's really cool is how it can separate from Tony to form like a prison bubble around people, and the suit even somehow still allows Tony to fly, and it protects him from the vacuum of space. I have no idea how it works, you have no idea how it works, it's the most comic booky thing I've ever heard of, but let's be honest, it's kind of awesome despite that. But if we are going to talk about one of Iron Man's crazy armors, why not talk about one of Batman's crazy armors? Enter the Hellbat suit in Batman and Robin number 33 by Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason. The Hellbat is the Justice League's gift to Batman, which he dons to go to Apocalypse, the homeworld of Darkseid, to try and recover Damian Wayne's body. Now this suit elevates Batman to be able to trade punches with Darkseid himself. It was forged by Superman inside of the sun and was made out of a shifting nanokinetic metallic material that could activate via voice commands. It allows Batman to fly, run at super speed, while also boosting up his strength and durability to ridiculous levels. It comes with adaptive camouflage, a unibeam style energy blast, and a shape-shifting cape that somehow literally turns into bats when it's ripped off, which is the most badass thing I have seen in a hot minute. Now obviously, with all the benefits it grants Batman, it has to have some kind of downside, or there's no reason that Bruce wouldn't just wear it all the time. That downside is that the Hellbat suit slowly drains Bruce Wayne's life force and would actually wipe him out for good if he wore it for too long. Luckily, he 
he only needed it to rescue his son, which he achieved in spectacular fashion. He then rebuilt the armor and kept it on the moon just in case. And of all people, Lois Lane was the only other person to use it to face the Eradicator. But going from one of the coolest suits in comic books to one of my absolute least favorites. When Black Condor first popped up on the scene in DC Comics, his choice of garb was interesting. Richard Gray Jr. gained the power of flight from being exposed to a radioactive meteor, though he believed he had just developed flight naturally after being raised by a flock of condors. I am not joking. So clearly, there is a level of, mm, how do you say, creativity here. Richard came back into society from his time with the Condors. He then took someone else's identity while also being a costumed hero. And I think his superhero costume perfectly exemplifies how utterly off the rocker this guy actually is. Richard took to wearing a cape that draped out under each arm, being attached to his wrists bracelets, giving the semblance of wings because fly. It kind of reminds me of Monica Rambeau's earlier costumes only mm, worse. Now I'm sure that his underarm cape wing things could probably have had some kind of effect on his flying, but the rest of the getup is a mystery as to why he chose it. Essentially, he wears a neck collar that connects to this big chunky belt with one piece of fabric in the front, and he accompanies that with some short shorts and some really ornate looking boots. And that's it. Thankfully though, later iterations of the character took their look in some much cooler and serious direction. Now in Marvel's Ultimate Universe, Universe, Valkyrie is an incredibly capable warrior and is probably one of the strongest members of the Ultimates. But she wasn't always that way. Initially, Barbara Norris was just a 19-year-old girl with no actual powers who was obsessed with superheroes, specifically Thor. She did have some martial arts skills though, and she used that skill as a member of the Ultimate Universe Defenders, who were really just wannabes. They went off pretending to be superheroes for clout, essentially until Loki gave them all real powers. She then joined the Ultimates, but all the while she was running around calling herself an Asgardian warrior, Valkyrie initially was pretty scantily clad for most of her appearances. I'm sure there are a group of fans who were all there for that, but for some of us, it just didn't make too much sense. It wasn't until later on, after working with the Ultimates for a little while longer, and having some real training with real Asgardians, that she would begin to armor up to bring her more in keeping with someone who was engaging in incredibly intense armed combat combat on the daily. But for a good chunk of time, she was jumping into battle extremely unprepared. Maybe coming back from the afterlife taught her armor was useful. But on the plus side, I think the change in her armor over time actually kind of shows her character's growth from a young, kind of out of her depth hero into a powerful warrior. Now switching back to DC Comics here, the history of Catwoman's look is a long and honestly incredibly odd story. Over time, she would go through a number of looks until it eventually became a leather suit, which had a more practical master thief vibe matched with a pair of cat eye goggles. And it became the character's most popular costume with later redesigns all primarily retaining the key elements of that suit. But in the very beginning, Selena Kyle was just a woman in a green dress that was also a thief. That kind of checks out for the comics at the time, and it also felt kind of unique in my personal opinion, compared to all the zany villains that were around. She kept it rather low key. All it took was one change to make that no longer the truth. Eventually, in 1940s Batman number three, Selena Kyle donned an orange costume with a cape with the super great addition of an absolutely terrifying full cat face mask. This was basically like a mascot's headpiece, but like a little bit smaller and tighter to her head, which I'm sure made it more practical, but for me, it's utter nightmare fuel. I don't know what it is about animal heads on human people bodies, but I am not here for it. Basically, she kept the dress that she started with, but now, get this, it was orange, with an incredibly high standing collar, and it was combined with a huge reddish orange cape. Tiny little blue heels were also there for added comfort, and she topped it all off with a terrifying full cat head piece. And I am, I don't want to talk about it anymore. We're moving on. I promise I am not trying to make this a Bat Family centered video, but I think we can kind of all agree that the Bat Family costumes go through so many different changes, from the terrifying early look of Catwoman, to the terrifying in a different way look of Cassandra 
Kane's Batgirl. Cassandra Kane is the daughter of David Kane and Lady Shiva, two assassins who raised and trained Cassandra to become basically a perfect warrior. She became the new Batgirl in Batman No Man's Land, and her costume was such a drastic change compared to other Batgirls of the past. If I was walking the streets of Gotham and I saw someone dressed like this, I would just move, like to a different city, possibly a different country, maybe even a different continent. Going from the almost friendly seeming outfits of Barbara Gordon's Batgirl costume to this dark, brooding, leather-clad costume with basically no human facial features that walked right out of someone's nightmares, it's so fitting for her and her character. It's intimidating, it's intense, and if I was a Gotham City criminal who came face to face with this in the middle of the night, my life would flash before my eyes before Cassandra even laid her extremely capable fists on me. Now, when the X-Men were first created, their costumes were basically all just slight variations of the same basic look. Hank McCoy, when he first showed up, was a shorter, stocky guy with huge hands and feet. That was basically it. His original costume didn't even have gloves or boots, which helped him to stand out even more. Now Hank was the bruiser on the team for sure, with his mutations being strength and agility. But while he may have been a somewhat odd looking guy, he was still fairly human looking. That is, until Amazing Adventures number 11 in 1972. Hank got a job at Roxxon, which is never going to go particularly well, what with them being incredibly shady. During his time with Roxxon, Hank developed a serum that acted as a catalyst for activating latent mutations for short periods of time. And then he drank it. The effects of this serum ended up making Hank grow gray fur. Yes, gray, not blue. His muscles expanded even more. His ears became large and pointed. He got claws and his canine teeth grew and became fangs. The serum further increased his superhuman agility, endurance, speed, and strength, as well as enhancing his senses, but it became the basis for how Hank McCoy would look going forward. It wasn't until Amazing Adventures 14 that he would become the blue, furry, awesome beast that we know and love thanks to Quasimodo, and he's been the same ever since. Now in for a runner-up spot, in the future timeline where Batman Beyond takes place, before Terry McGinnis came along, Bruce Wayne was well aware that his body was beginning to fail him, which meant that he needed to build a suit capable of making up for his aging body. After pouring his vast resources and knowledge into his creation, the Batman Beyond suit was born. After spending years and years fighting crime in Gotham, this suit is only one of a few bat suits that are actually bulletproof, but it can do way more than just deflect projectiles. The Beyond suit has allowed Terry McGinnis to walk through burning buildings, survive underwater for extended periods of time, and the suit is even resistant to radiation. It features neuromuscular amplification, which has been able to help Terry bend metal bars, lift giant metal eye beams, move large quantities of rubble, and massive light projectiles. Random, but trust me. It's not all physical, but it's not all physical. While Terry had previously been able to hear through thick walls and glass, upgraded version of his suit takes advantage of a system that allows him to literally see straight through walls. This suit literally has a polygraph device in order to tell when villains are lying. The Batman Beyond suit features almost too many things like cameras, voice communicators, retractable claws and wings, an incredible stealth mode, and it's even got lasers, man. But the best part of the whole thing is just being able to look at it. What an icon. Okay, for our last point today, he may have had a mullet at the time, but Superman in a black costume? Come on! After the Man of Steel was resurrected in Superman Volume 2, number 81, after his death at the hands of Doomsday, he came back with an all-black costume with silver accents. I don't know about you guys, and I know a lot of people hate that mullet, but you put any hero in a sleek black version of their normal suit compared to their usual color schemes, and I am there for it. Spider-Man did it, and it was one of his most iconic looks. Superman did it, and lordy lord, he killed it. The costume even got a modern revamp in Zack Snyder's Justice League when Henry Cavill's Superman comes back to life from a very similar doomsday defeat, and it looked even better that time. Sure, black-suited Superman may not have lasted lasted too long, and sure, the red and blue is just way more iconic and symbolic of the character, this costume has a definitive place in my list of absolutely favorite superhero looks alongside black suited Spider-Man. Sorry we didn't talk about it. At number 10, we've got Aquaman. Looking specifically at the redesigns that occurred between the Super Friends era and the 90s look, there's no arguing that the Super Friends look is pretty corny. Some would say that any redesign would have made it better, but what went into making Aquaman go from looking like like this 
to looking like this was a decision that not only changed the way we saw Aquaman, but how we knew him as well. Firstly, the original look has him extremely clean looking, like he's been untouched by any battle, which we all know isn't true. And maybe that's just how superheroes were illustrated back then. But the 90s look has him with a harpoon for a hand, no shirt, and this sweet metal chest piece that just makes him look like he's really from the depths of the ocean. His trident also has a major redesign here that gives a more menacing look, like it's really designed to do real damage. And maybe it's not quite part of the costume, but the long hair and beard just seem like the right choice for Aquaman that should have been a thing from day one maybe. But maybe that's just me. Number 9. The Hulk now, this isn't exactly a redesign, and I'll give you that. It's more like a mistake. It's a mistake that led to one of the most iconic characters for Marvel. When the Incredible Hulk first appeared in Marvel Comics, his skin was actually a gray color to keep him indistinguishable from any real world race, as Stanley wanted. But an issue with the colorist's ink actually led to the character coming out looking green, which, I mean, you still get the desired effect. Stan actually ended up liking the green more, and they stuck with it. Good call, Stan the man. We miss you. Narratively, they even gave a reason for this. At first saying it was prolonged gamma exposure, and later saying that Grey Hulk was an alternate personality version of the Hulk. At number 8, we have Wolverine. Wolverine's costume has had many changes over the years, but the change from the original yellow look is a significant design choice in the right direction. The thing is, Wolverine looks pretty cool in the original X-Men uniform, but something about this darker look feels like it complements his personality more. The red eyes and the black gray tones in this outfit are so cool and much more menacing than the classic yellow tiger stripe design, which reflects what X-Force stands for as well. X-Force is a mutant organization put together by Wolverine himself, which applies lethal force if the mission calls for it. It makes sense that Wolverine would be behind something like this because of his inherent Machiavellian outlook on life. This character has lived for so long and through so much that his jadedness has become a staple to who he is. And this redesign just strikes me as being a more accurate portrayal of who Logan is behind the costume. Number 7, Drax the Destroyer. Thanks to the MCU, it's really hard to think of Drax the Destroyer in any other way. But the MCU's depiction actually borrows from the redesign of Drax from 2004. For this though, Drax here was, well he had a cape. Capes are cool, no doubt, no doubt, but um, I mean he's just so much better now. Take a look at his design when he was first introduced in the 1970s. Bright green skin with a very comic booky purple costume. It was unique, I'll, I'll give you that, but as the rival to the mad titan Thanos, it's just nowhere near as imposing and intimidating as it should be. The 2004 design with the pale green skin, red tattoos, and knives evoke the kind of strength and power that comes from the title of The Destroyer. At number 6 we have The Flash. Looking at the Jay Garrick Golden Age Flash, we can all agree that there was room for improvement. Need I mention the elephant in the room? The silly hat? Okay, I know it has sentimental value, having been his father's World War I helmet, but it just doesn't look very cool. I'm sorry. And he would like he would use it as a weapon by throwing it at bad guys. Anyway, I'm just roasting him now. But when Barry Allen is introduced in 1956 with a new outfit, it seems like it was always meant to be that way. His helmet is replaced with a mask and the little lightning bolts stick around, which we're happy to see. This costume then basically remains untouched until today, having undergone a few redesigns that didn't really stick, like Kid Flash, which I don't know. It doesn't do it for me. And the John Fox look, which once again, I don't know if it's the right decision for the character. I think the best place the design has found itself is Wally West's costume, which just gives the character a sleek look with lots of integrity. Number 5, Lobo. Okay, before you jump on me in the comments saying he's a villain, he's more of an anti-hero, okay? When Lobo first appeared in DC Comics, he looked like poo. You were more likely to laugh than to think he had any kind of strength going for him. He had an orange and light purple skin tight suit for Pete's sake. But when he reappeared with his biker motif, it just made sense. Ripped jeans, leather gloves and a vest, with all his craziness, foul language, weapons and spiked hair, he needed the rest of him to match. And I think we can all agree his iconic hook was definitely a worthwhile addition. Let's just forget about his newest New 52 redesign though. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> At number four, we have Iron Man. 
This is one of the biggest redesigns on the list and for good reason. The old Iron Man is made to look like he's literally wearing a big suit of armor that Tony Stark would like crudely bolt himself into. But over time with the way that the character's abilities become more advanced, so does the costume. It gets sleeker, more form fitting, and the colors are toned down a bit making for a more realistic look tonally. Something I noticed that's a real eyesore from the original look is the design of the face. The original eye holes and mouth make Iron Man look kind of soulless, like there isn't even a person in the costume. And sometimes that was actually the case, but as Tony Stark's storyline is refined, it seems as though his costume gets less and less blocky as well. And this wasn't only the case for Iron Man. It was arguably the case for every other hero in this list and beyond. With comic books getting more legitimized over time, the depth of all the characters expanded, allowing for cooler, less fantastical designs that you might actually be able to imagine seeing in the real world. Number three, Spider-Man. This is an arguable point. Spider-Man's red and blue classic suit is extremely iconic, and I don't think anyone thinks it's bad. The Sam Raimi version of that suit is, mwah, it's beautiful. But if you tell me that you dislike the black Venom symbiote or the black cloth version of this suit, one, you're a liar, and two, we can't be friends. This suit was actually designed by a guy called Randy Schuler for a contest Marvel had and they paid him $220 for it. I'm not sure how that compares to today, inflation wise, but that $220 bought the Spider-Man's greatest designs outside the original. So great, they even came up with excuses for him to wear it after getting rid of the symbiote version of it. Okay, at number two, we have the Batman costume designs from the movies. This is a big one that I think a lot of people agree with. Looking at his original look from the 1966 Batman uh, TV show and the redesigns that took place to get to Christopher Nolan's designs for The Dark Knight, it's clear to anyone that these were major steps in the right direction. Although the original look was probably meant to be a bit goofy, it still could have looked a little less like pajamas and still gotten the feeling across. This is an important transformation to analyze because Batman's original outfit speaks to how seriously comic books were being taken back in the 60s, and that was not. Not very seriously. Honestly, Adam West looks like he pulled a $10 Batman costume off the secondhand shelf at a Halloween store in November. I mean, it barely looks like the cowl fit him. And then when we were blessed with the Dark Knight trilogy back in 2005, we were reminded that these days, Batman is a serious character that, deser that deserves a serious look. His suit got darker, more slick, and it finally looked like real armor, which makes sense for the subject matter which has, over the years, gotten much more gruesome and violent. This was an essential redesign that demonstrates not only how far Batman has come as a character, but how far comic books have come as well. And the massive success of the Nolan trilogy suggests that people were ready for that change. Number one, Carol Danvers. The original Carol Danvers Miss Marvel costume is so incredibly different from her redesign as Captain Marvel that you'd be forgiven for thinking they were different people at first. Her Miss Marvel costume was characterized by a black leotard with a big yellow lightning bolt, bare legs, and black boots and gloves. While being an iconic costume, knowing what we know of her backstory and looking at the tone and personality of her character, it didn't seem right for Carol Danvers. When she jumped on the scene with her red and blue pilot-esque Captain Marvel uniform with the shorter hair and the star emblem, she exudes the confidence and strength that her character demands. She even still kept the red sash belt thing, which was probably my favorite part of her costume. This is the suit that inspired her MCU costume with not a single trace or mention of her Miss Marvel suit. It is also the suit that almost everyone has gotten to know her by and has completely revamped and reimagined her character. Number 10, Superman. This version of Superman, the one in the Kingdom Come story by Mark Wade, with art by Alex Ross and Mike Carlin, is set in an alternate reality, Earth 22. Meaning, it isn't a baseline redesign for the character. For that matter, it isn't even a complete overhaul of Superman's costume. The only difference they made to the costume was that Clark's hair had silver streaks to show his age, and the yellow parts of his emblem were changed to black. Otherwise, his costume was a very classic Superman getup. But those two little changes, plus just the overall style of the art itself, did something to this Superman that for me, it just makes, it just makes me tingle, you know? Number nine. Daredevil. When Daredevil first came out on the scene in 1964, his look was different from the one most readers are used to. Instead of his normal color scheme, Daredevil instead had a predominantly yellow suit, with only parts of the suit being the familiar red color. Now, in my humble opinion, 
The yellow and red suit has its own perks. The overall design of the suit is fairly similar to what would come later. But I will agree that when he showed up in Daredevil number no. 7 with the all red suit, courtesy of artist Wally Wood, it was an instant stick. It was more in keeping with the darker, brooding, street level nature of his stories. And it stuck for, well, pretty much the rest of his publication. Hey guys, before we go on, I just want to say a quick little thanks for watching. I also want to say thanks for those of you that leave comments below. I read a lot of them, and you guys always have interesting and helpful things to say. So thanks. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I won't forget to get on with this video. Number eight, the Punisher logo. Okay, I want to talk about this one for a couple of reasons, but let's just say it. Straight up, it's controversial, which always makes for a good discussion. Basically, the classic Punisher logo that has been around since the 70s got a bit of a redesign this year. Punisher has joined the hand, and in doing so, he has changed his logo to resemble that of an Oni. There's also reason to believe that the symbol may reflect his status within the organization. Unfortunately, there is also a real world political reason for the change. The logo itself was being adopted by real world police officers, which is kind of odd considering Punisher is pretty anti-authority, and was even worn by some of those who were involved in the Capitol riots, leading Marvel to make a politically motivated change. Love it or hate it, it is the new look for the character right now. I'm not totally opposed to it, but I know at least a few of you guys out there are a little upset. Let me know what you think below. Number seven, X-Men. I don't know if you know what the original costumes of the X-Men looked like back in the day. Yellow and dark navy blue with yellow and black boots and gloves. Except for Beast, who was still vaguely human and didn't wear boots or gloves, and Iceman, who was more like Snowman. The matching costumes definitely show that this was a team, even with their different and unique mutant abilities. There have been many iterations of X-Men costumes since, but for me, when the characters themselves got their own individual costumes in issue 39 of the comic, that's when they really came into their own. The leader of the team, Cyclops, has generally used this look and variations on this look ever since. Mostly. The other members took a bit more time to find iconic looks, namely Angel and Beast, who eventually got his blue fur. Number six, Star-Lord. When Star-Lord showed up in Marvel preview number four, he was a far cry away from what most fans have come to recognize him as. I think he kind of looks a lot like Owlman from the Watchmen comics, to be honest, but even Peter's personality was much different. The tagline on the comic was, he stalks the galaxy, one man on a mission of cosmic vengeance. That doesn't sound like the typical wisecracking, sarcastic young hero we know today. Even before Chris Pratt took on the character, Star-Lord was revamped in the 2006 and 2007 Annihilation event, where he formed the Guardians of the Galaxy and got an incredible new costume change. Ditching the more cow-like headpiece for a full helmet and the skin-tight outfit for a more loose-fitting uniform. It just gives his character a much more distinctive look, in my opinion. Number five, Green Lantern. Technically, this point can be argued with. This isn't so much a redesign as a wholly different character, but ask anyone who isn't deeply knowledgeable of the comics, who the original Green Lantern is, and you're likely to hear them say Hal Jordan. Now, I'm just guessing here, but I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Hal Jordan's look, compared to the one of Alan Scott, it's just so much more iconic. Alan Scott sported a black cape with a red collared top, green pants, and a sweet normal looking belt. Sure, he is a different character and not technically an official Green Lantern, but when Hal Jordan came in with a green and black suit with hints of white, it just stuck. Let's just not talk about the movie version, okay? Number four, Robin Damien Wayne. We talked about Batman in the last video, so it's only fair we talk about his ward. Specifically, I wanna talk about the costume of the newest Robin and Batman's son, Damian Wayne. If we go back in time and look at the classic original Robin's costume, well, let's just say it kind of goes with the costume of the Cape Crusader at the time. In other words, it's incredibly impractical. I'm also thinking the bare legs wouldn't bode too well in the streets of Gotham, but that's just me. The costume was evolved over the years for sure, but the one that Damian wears when he appears as Robin in 2006, it's just like, ooh, I like it. You know, it's kind of hard to get specific on what makes this one so much better, I'll be honest. But if we just slap up some comparison picks, I mean, it's just better. Number three, Ultimate's Hawkeye. The Ultimate Universe in Marvel sees a lot of changes to character designs that honestly kind of reflect the MCU looks just a little bit. Overall, I think the outfits are improvements on the originals. I wanna give a big nod to Ultimate Thor. 
But I think the best of the character overhauls would have to be Hawkeye's Ultimate Universe costume. The black vest, the crew cut, and the red glasses make him look even more like a secret agent, which he is. It's also a bit edgier and darker than his 616 counterpart, which most of the Ultimates are considering the comics were aimed at teens. Fight me in the comments, but I definitely prefer this costume. Number two. Batgirl. Batgirl first appeared in Detective Comics 359, sporting an all black costume with a yellow bat symbol, belt, boots, and gloves. Personally, I didn't have much of a problem with this look. I thought it was simple, for sure, and quite basic. Just like the other members of the Bat family, Barbara Gordon also got a ton of redesigns through the years. But in 2014, when she got a redesign thanks to artists Cameron Stort, Brendan Fletcher, and Babs Tarr, the new look, much like Damien's Robin suit, just made more sense. The costume was much more practical. More of a jacket kind of design with a removable cape. The belt was more casual, more like a holster design. Her design had much more personality too, this way. Which really works for the character herself, who also has a strong personality. Number one, Nightwing. Nightwing first appeared, after leaving the Bat Family, in Tales of the Teen Titans Volume 1, number 44. And his costume was, honestly, not too bad. It was goofy for sure. Don't get me started on the collar, but with those gold wing designs, it was pretty cool. I'd be a fool though if I didn't say that the blue V costume that debuted in 1996 is the best suit that character has ever worn. If we don't take into account his newest DC Rebirth suit, which is basically just a slightly updated version of this one. The simple blue bird across the chest and into the arms, mixed with the rest of the suit being black, yeah, it's a simpler look, but one that ultimately works better than any other. At this point, comic books are just a few steps away from being a fashion magazine with all the incredible looks villains are pulling out. I cannot thank the person that commented Clock King on part one enough because I now have the absolute pleasure of knowing this guy exists. He is fabulous and deserves attention. His real name is William Talkman. His costume's mask is a working clock. He has this amazing red cape that is lined with fur and a blue 19th century king's jacket and even has a velvet crown on top of his clock head. His hideout is a clock tower, and the first crime he commits in Batman Brave and the Bold is robbing the museum of clocks. Not robbing a museum of their clocks, robbing a museum dedicated to clocks. That's amazing. He gets to the robbery on his clock helicopter and doesn't have powers, just clock themed gadgets to mess around with. Clock King has been around for a while. In the 1966 Batman show, he trapped Batman and Robin in an hourglass so they would drown in the sand while he steals. Bruce Wayne's collection of antique pocket watches. Later on in the episode, we see him with a very fancy top hat on his head with a little clock inside. In 1960, we see him for the very first time in World's Finest Comics, and he is pulling a look. He still has a clock on his face, but his suit is blue and has clocks all over it like polka dots, and he has a yellow cape, boots, gloves, and hood. The last time we saw Clock King was in 2023 in the animated show Harley Quinn. At this point, his head is a clock, and he's engaged to the Riddler. I need a Met Gala that is villain themed, and I don't mean everyone is wearing black and has a smoky eye. I want people dressing like Clock King and Crazy Quilt. Personally, I'm pulling up his calendar man with 16 costume reveals. Let me know what you're wearing down below. Time to move on to Clock King's brother, at least in the 1966 Batman show they're related. I'm referring to the Mad Hatter. He also has a very niche interest he is determined to steal. If you guessed hats, you're a winner. The one hat he wants most of all is Batman's cowl. That causes all the problems you'd expect. No matter what universe the Mad Hatter is in, he is usually wearing all green or all blue. Funny enough, the actor that portrays the Mad Hatter in the 60s show shares a last name with Bruce Wayne. Most variations of him lean into a lot of mismatched and fun prints, some with checkered pants, some with big bow ties with polka dots, and just lots of contrasting colors overall. The Mad Hatter is delusional but committed. Lots of his crimes are based and themed around the Alice in Wonderland book. He doesn't just like hats, he will also plant mind control devices in them too, so they prove to be as useful as they are stylish. At one point in Detective Comics 510, the Mad Hatter plots to take over Wall Street, the stock market, aim high my friend, and he just has a monkey. It's unclear where it came from. Lewis Carroll did create a famous monkey puzzle, so that may have been the inspiration. More recent versions of the Mad Hatter, like 2015's Batman Arkham Knight and the Gotham TV show have made the Mad Hatter a bit edgier, wearing darker colors or all black, but I prefer the monkey man. 
Batman. Reinventing a character isn't just something the writers do, sometimes the characters make that choice all on their own. This is the case of Paste Pot Pete, later known as the Trapster. His OG name came from an invention of his, a multi-polymer adhesive, or simply put, it's just like really, really sticky glue and sticky paste. The paste was very popular and the guy made a lot of money, but he wanted more. Believing a life of crime would add more green to his pocket, he turned to the dark side. It technically did add a lot of green to his pocket. He wears a fabulous green jumpsuit with a white collar. The details of the fit are a matching purple nightcap and a big purple bow right on his neck. And then of course, his bucket of paste he carries around with his weapon of choice connected. It's something called a paste gun. It's basically an extreme glue gun. Now, he did make a bit of green in the money sense as well. He successfully robbed a bank and even stole a missile, but before he could sell that off, he was bested by the Human Torch. This causes a lifelong rivalry. Pete even runs into Spider-Man later on in Spider-Man Human Torch issue 1. Spider-Man gets a very good laugh out of Pete's name, much to Pete's annoyance. This is actually the reason Pete changed his name. It literally says, on panel, that's it, I'm changing my name. And he picked Trapster to sound more menacing. The later versions of his costume of upgraded him from having to carry around the massive paste bucket, and instead it flows through a chest piece. His Trapster version changed up his colors, now red and yellow with a backpack that contains the glue. Polka Dot Man is kind of similar to Spectro that we saw in part one, but is more of a twister board because he has a white suit covered in multicolored dots. He has a red belt at the waist with a circle in the middle and a red mask over his eyes. The dots on his suit are very special. Each one can transform into a specific weapon or a gadget when he removes it. So he tears off a dot. That's the equivalent of getting punched in the face. Another is a buzzsaw. His suit is electrically powered, but when he can't access the electricity, he resorts to using a baseball bat. His crime planning method is pretty clever. One time he went on a crime spree around Gotham and the points on the map turned out to be a big connect the dots picture of a stick man. I'm not the only person who loved this. It's implied that the citizens of Gotham were also big fans and Polka Dot became a local celebrity, possibly even appearing on local talk shows. He's been featured in Batman the Brave and the Bold, the Lego Batman movie, and the Suicide Squad. The Ringmaster's main power is hypnosis, and he's good at it. I am hypnotized by his outfit. Here's the thing. All the components, when they are separate, look nice. It's just when they get put together that I am raising an eyebrow. He's got these nice purple pants and a matching tie, a green jacket with black stars all over it, a purple top hat with the circle swirly hypnosis thing in it, and green boots with black stars to match. His boots are nice. I would wear them. A statement boot like that is back in style. Ringmaster leads a criminal organization called the circus of crime. Shocking. The crime is he uses the hypnosis device on his hat to gain control of his audiences and then make them give him all their money. He's fought Spider-Man, Daredevil, and the Hulk. In a fight with Spider-Man and Daredevil, Spider-Man gets hypnotized and put under the Ringmaster's control. It is during this fight that we learn that the way to defeat the Ringmaster's mind control is to just knock his hat off. And from what I can tell in the photos, he doesn't have a chin strap or anything, so he seems pretty easy to stop if you really tried. If I for him, I would just add a chin strap. Up next is the musical mastermind that is Clarinetto. He is part of the parody series The Powerful Pachyderms. Clarinetto initially poses as a music teacher, but he reveals himself to be the former head of the Brotherhood of Evil Musicians. The former job reveal also comes with a costume reveal, of course. He dons a red and purple helmet with two music notes on top, a red band uniform, and matching purple boots and cape. The star of the show, though, is his clarinet, which has the power to control guitar strings when he plays it. Similar to Snake Charming, but weirder. Clarinetto was teaching a group of students. He wasn't really teaching them music and more teaching them to be celebrity impersonator fighting squads. He and his impersonators are eventually defeated by the Elephant Squad through a powerful energy blast. This entire issue is so fun, it's so ridiculous, and not meant to be taken seriously. And if I could sit in on any writer's room, it would have been this one. The Doom Patrol comics have produced some interesting characters like Beard Hunter. The first version of Beard Hunter is just a regular guy, as regular as one can be when you're a highly trained hitman. Regular might not be the word for this guy because he is jealous of anyone who can grow a beard and therefore wants to off them and steal their beard. His spoils from the hits are then worn around his waist. He also has a skull on his chest with a beard pinned to it like a brooch. It's a look. Beard Hunter can't grow his own beard as he has a hormone deficiency. Because of the skull detail on his chest, many people think that Beard Hunter is a parody of the Punisher. His 
original suit from the 1991 comic is all red and he has this army green backpack to hold his weapons. Beard Hunter is featured in the live action Doom Patrol show and this version is somehow even weirder. He has actual superpowers. He is able to find his victims no matter where they are by consuming a piece of their beard trimmings. My favorite fact I learned about him in the final pages of his debut comic Doom Patrol 2 number 45, he gets electrocuted on tinfoil and it's so bad that he nearly passes out nearly. What makes him actually pass out is when three heavenly visitors come to him and he remembers God has a beard. Batman inspires people on today's list. He has inspired some truly wacky individuals. Signal Man is just another great example. He started out as Phil Cobb, a little guy in terms of Gotham's massive crime scene. He was determined to become a big Batman level problem and he figured the best and easiest way to do so was to have an extremely specific gimmick. Judging from the likes of Batman villains on this list already, He's onto something. Signal Man first debuted in 1957. This version of him has a yellow cape covered in green shapes and symbols. There are moons and swirls and even some stuff from the workplace hazardous materials information system. He wears striped shorts that are very similar to caution tape and the rest of his suit is red. The whole signal idea came from the bat signal and how much of modern society is run by signals in general. There was also a brief period in 1961 where he viewed Signal Man to be a failure so he changed his name to Blue Bowman. In by the Green Arrow. That didn't work out either and he was sent straight to jail and not seen until 1976 when he made a comeback in Detective Comics 466 back as Signal Man. He is just a guy, he has no superpowers, but he does carry around a knockout gas gun and his belt has tech that can change any signal he encounters. The Highwayman of the US 1 comic series is so interesting. The story may be about intergalactic truckers, but it's hard to ignore the fashion choice that is Demon Cowboy Trucker. To be clear though, I am obsessed. This villain used to be a regular guy, Jefferson Archer, brother to the hero of US-1, Ulysses Archer. Jefferson was a trucker on Earth, but as he got older, he wasn't able to drive as long in between sleeping periods, so he was losing out on work to younger drivers. He didn't like this and tried a bunch of different, not always safe, methods of staying awake until he finally just decided to sell his soul to a demon. Which I love the implications of this because he didn't sell his soul to become a billionaire, he sold his soul to work forever, which means he loves his job and I love that for him. The demon took away his capacity for fear and he doesn't need to sleep anymore, but every time he uses the inhuman tactics, he becomes more demonic. The first version of him from the 1983 comic is pretty tame, just a guy in some pants, a sweater, and a long billowing cape. The wilder versions of him come later. In 2009's Ghost Rider Volume 6, he is pictured with a red eye, the other covered by an eye patch. His skin is deathly pale and he is wearing a full fab red and black cowboy ensemble. I actually really like this one and it's what I based my outfit on today. For Doom Patrol villains, it seems like a lot of the characters start out with an unserious, satirical, or just ridiculous premise, and then the writers take that and come up with a serious, genuine backstory to justify the choice. We saw this earlier with Beard Hunter, and we will see it again now with Codpiece. The creator of Codpiece, Rachel Pollock, was asked to do a one-shot for the Doom Patrol series, and she got creative and pulled from a hero, Green Arrow. She said during an interview with Fortress Comics that she was intrigued by the idea of Green Arrow's single quiver holding dozens of different types of arrows and thought the absurdity of that would make a great parody villain. The adult themes in Doom Patrol then inspired the stroke of genius that was Codpiece because that is a real accessory that has been used by men for hundreds of years for the same area as Codpiece's weapon. A modern version of a Codpiece that is used nowadays would be sports protective equipment. The rest of Codpiece's outfit is pretty normal as far as villain outfits go. It's just the multi-use weapon on his lower half that is wild. The thing has lots of features. Most interesting to me is the retractable boxing gloves. Codpiece's serious backstory to justify him wearing this is one time a girl told him she didn't want to go out with him because he was short. And he is not the sharpest fork in the drawer, so he assumed she must have been talking about something on his lower half. Number 10. Nova. All right, starting off our little list today is going to actually be more of a different version of a character of the same name rather than a redesign. There have been multiple Nova Primes throughout the history of the universe. Richard Ryder is absolutely the main one, and he is fantastic. I absolutely adore his Nova Prime costume. But when we first saw Samuel Alexander in Point One Number One in 2011 sporting the black Nova helmet, I'm sorry, it just did something special for me. I really enjoy it. 
Granted, being a younger, more slender guy, he doesn't exude the same kind of power that Richard Rider does. But that doesn't make him any less powerful, and it doesn't make his costume any less impressive. Also, Disney, if you're listening, let me play Samuel Alexander, please. I want to wear his costume. Thank you. Number nine, Beast. We mentioned in the last video the way the X-Men uniforms were all essentially variations of the same costume. Hank McCoy was a shorter, stocky guy. He had huge hands and feet, and his original costume didn't even have gloves or boots, which helped him to stand out even more. Hank was the bruiser on the team for sure, with his mutations being strength and agility. But while he may have been a somewhat odd looking guy, he was still fairly human looking. That is, until Amazing Adventures number 11 in 1972. Hank got a job at Roxxon, basically, where he developed a serum that acted as a catalyst for activating latent mutations for short periods of time. And then he drank it. The effects of this serum ended up making Hank grow gray fur. His muscles expanded, his ears became large and pointed, he got claws, and his canine teeth grew and became fangs. The serum further increased his superhuman agility, endurance, speed, and strength, as well as enhancing his senses. In Amazing Adventures 14, his fur would become blue thanks to Quasimodo, and he's been the same ever since. Whoa, 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 slow your roll there. I gotta talk about how great you are. Every time you like and subscribe, it sends a ripple through the YouTube algorithm that makes this channel look just a bit more attractive. So thanks for doing that. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook as well. And I'll carry on making this video. Number 8. Scarlet Witch Now, I don't know if everyone's seen the WandaVision show, but it's definitely one you should check out if you are a Marvel fan. One of the best parts, at least for me, was seeing Wanda Maximoff get a new look. A look that pays homage to the origins of the character, but embraces a modern design, and just makes her look like a total badass. Which I think most of the fans out there have really been craving. Her powers in the MCU haven't always been all that they potentially could be, even though she outclasses almost every other hero in the MCU. But moving forward, I think we are definitely starting to see her break out of the shell, and this costume really embodies that. I am so excited to see her in the Multiverse of Madness. She is gonna be sick. Number seven, Deathstroke. We always gotta include at least one morally ambiguous character on these lists, but at least this time, it's when he was actually acting as a hero. When Deathstroke was the leader of a superhero team, Defiance, he wore an awesome black and white costume. But not only did this costume change up his color scheme, he actually got a cape. Edna Mode would not approve. His black and orange color scheme is definitely a classic, and I'm not necessarily saying this is better, but I mean it comes extremely close. It's better. And the story it belongs to is it's such a good one. Check it out. Number six, Superman's black costume. All right, here we go. Look, he may have a mullet, but Superman in a black costume? I mean, come on. After the Man of Steel was resurrected in Superman Volume 2, number 81, after his death at the hands of Doomsday, he came back with an all black costume with silver symbol and wrist gauntlet type things. I don't know about you guys, and I, I know a lot of people hate that mullet, but you put any hero in black compared to their usual color scheme, and I'm here for it. The costume would get a revamp in the Justice League live action movie when Henry Cavill comes back to life, and it looked even better there. It may not have lasted too long, but I think this costume has a definite place in my favorite alternate superhero costumes. Number five, Monica Rambeau. When Monica Rambeau showed up in her costume in Amazing Spider-Man Annual number 16, it was a statement. I liked it, honestly. It was simple and unique. I don't really like the underarm wing things, they were kind of weird, but ultimately it worked for the time. She has been around for a long time, being part of the Avengers, Next Wave, and the Ultimates. But it was in the Next Wave number one where I think she got the best addition to her costume. All it took was a coat, and she instantly became so much cooler. The color of her under costume changed a bit, which it consistently does, but the jacket has now become a staple, and every time she's wearing it, I am swooning. Number four. Red Hood. When Jason Todd was killed by the Joker in Death of the Family, it was a huge thing. It was heartbreaking, it was brutal, it was visceral. Six months after his death though, he was resurrected. 
and he was restored by Talia al Ghul in the Lazarus Pits. He would join and be trained by the League of Assassins, eventually leaving to pursue justice, although a bit more brutally than before. Enter the Red Hood, and an absolutely awesome new costume. Inspired by the original Red Hood costume worn by Joker, Jason's Red Hood costume is so much better. It's menacing and tactical and badass. I think I have a thing for jackets because, again, I love the frickin' jacket! Number 3, Batgirl Cassandra Cain. Okay, look, we talked about Batgirl in the last point, but we were talking about Barbara. If we want to get really into Batgirl designs that will knock your socks off, we don't have to look any farther than Cassandra Kane. Cassandra is the fourth Batgirl, and she is the daughter of David Kane and Lady Shiva, two assassins who raised and trained Cassandra to become the perfect warrior. She became the new Batgirl in Batman No Man's Land, and let me just say, if I was walking the streets of Gotham and I saw someone dressed like this, I would just move, like to a different city. It's so fitting for her, it's intimidating, it's intense, and if I was a criminal, it would give me nightmares. Number 2, Blade. When Blade first appeared in Tomb of Dracula number 10, he had an interesting costume choice. Blade sported a collared jacket with a bandolier armed with stakes, riding boots, and let's not forget the super sweet yellow glasses. More of like a cool pirate with yellow goggles than a vampire hunter. He would have different variations of the costume. One that was actually pretty good was when he wore green goggles, a purple jacket, and matching boots, green trousers, and a yellow belt. But in Night Stalkers number one in the 90s, he finally showed up in the leather, sporting a leather jacket, all black clothing with the katanas. Of course, this was born out of the 90s, but it stuck. It has evolved over the years, but the key things introduced have stayed. The leather. The leather stuck. Number one. Storm. The X-Men Storm is one of the coolest looking characters in Marvel Comics, for me. And that fact only gets reinforced in the Marvel Dark Ages number 4, when she shows up in a Wakandan inspired gold and silver costume. It is absolutely stunning. Storm herself is an extremely fashion heavy member of the X-Men. She changes up her look often, and it's usually in unique and awesome ways. Like I really, really liked when she had the mohawk. But this Wakanda costume just takes the absolute cake for me. It calls back to her original costume from the second Genesis X-Men, but it's regal as hell, which it should be when she's the queen of Wakanda. The designs are amazing, and if I saw her show up like this, I believe she was a goddess too. At number 10, we have Green Lantern's Power Ring upgrade that allows the rings to communicate with the other Green Lanterns in the universe. This feature, added by the Guardians of the Universe, is a huge upgrade that gives the ring a major advantage. Although there has always been an emergency beacon offered as part of the ring's powers, this is only meant to be used to relay to other Green Lanterns in times of distress. The homing beacon is a fantastic way to bring all the powers of the Green Lanterns together at any time giving them that extra support whenever it's needed. Or even aside from combat situations, this is a great power to allow Green Lanterns to communicate with one another about strategy to better prepare themselves in the planning stages. Considering there are plenty of Green Lanterns throughout the universe, it would otherwise be extremely difficult to ensure that everyone is where they need to be at any given moment. Pretty nifty, and an underrated ability if you ask me. At number 9, we have Sam Wilson's Captain America suit. This is a huge upgrade for this suit, giving it vibranium wings, gatling guns, and a nice little clip for the shield right on his back. While Captain America's suit usually doesn't change very drastically over the years, it's pretty obvious that it's due to the fact that Cap is strong enough that he doesn't need to rely on his suit to help him. He's usually more of a leader, with his most valuable assets being his military strategy and brute strength. But when he hands off the moniker to Falcon, the classic suit and shield get a huge upgrade. And not because Falcon needs the support of his suit, but because... Why not? I mean, Falcon has to have wings, so already a Captain America suit with wings is enough. But throwing those guns on it really brings the suit to a new level. And he still gets to keep the shield. I think a mortal retired Steve Rogers will sleep soundly at night 
knowing Sam is on the job with this upgraded suit. At number eight, we have Captain Marvel's Nega Bands. Although you may know Marvel's suit as already having the Nega Bands as part of the package, this wasn't always the case. Before he acquires them, he is still extremely powerful from being empowered by a cosmic entity named Zoe, later properly realized as Eon. He's able to fly faster than light speed, has superhuman strength, and is also able to teleport anywhere in the universe instantly. So it's hard to imagine how a suit upgrade would offer any sort of improvement, but it does. When the Nega Bands are added to the equation, Marvel is then able to travel between reality and the negative zone whenever he wants. But that's not all at all. He can also absorb any energy that is coming at him be it a powerful blast from an enemy or even the energy of the sun. They are also capable of providing healing powers and increased strength. They even keep the wearer from requiring food, air, water, and sleep, which is pretty helpful. They do have their limitations though. They don't protect from drowning or gas-based attacks. And this actually leads to Captain Marvel's demise when he's inflicted with a poison gas by Nitro that actually gives him terminal cancer. But anyway, let's not get too dark here. These Nega Bands are a huge upgrade for Marvel and that's all that matters in terms of this suit. At number seven is the Superman Godfall suit upgrade. Now, considering Superman's unmatched strength, he doesn't really have much use for upgrades in that regard, but this suit upgrade is all about the looks and the motorcycle. In the Superman Godfall storyline, Superman has lost his memory and is living in what appears to be a dystopian city called Kandor, alongside his wife Lila. It's a state we aren't used to seeing Superman in. He's got a job, working at a kitchen, and appears to be living a pretty human life, without even his secret identity needing to be hidden. And his costume is just... It's so cool and Blade Runner-esque with a Tron-style motorcycle to boot. I mean, who doesn't want to see Superman having access to a motorcycle when he's facing off against dystopian villains? It's just a great reimagining of the character and the suit he wears, and I think it's a fair addition to this list. Upgrades don't always have to be based on abilities and features, you know. Looks matter too. Okay, at number six, I'm putting Blade's silver armor from Blade Vampire Hunter from 1999. Taking a break from the usual mysterious green or black trench coat, this suit offers a whole new image for Blade. Now, I don't know if I'd say this is his best look ever, but I will say that it's a big upgrade in terms of utility. Having armor seems like a pretty obvious call for a vampire hunter from the get-go, so when I found the silver armor, I knew it had to make an appearance on the list. And the main reason why this suit ranks higher on the list is that silver is known to be a weakness for vampires, which are naturally a threat to a vampire hunter. This suggests that aside from the defense upgrade, this suit also gives Brooks a huge added advantage against his typical foes, on top of the obvious protective advantage. Even though it only sticks around for two years, this is a good upgrade for the character that offers much more protection than his typical garb. With a silver chest plate and silver gauntlets, this costume just gives Eric Brooks a more reasonable level of protection and sort of fits him into the category of superhero a bit more at least in the traditional sense of how he looks. I still think it was the right move to bring him back to his original black leather jacket after the suit ran its course, but it is a good moment for Blade's armor in the grand scheme of things. At number five, we've got a controversial one, Wolverine's heated claws. Although this upgrade is known to be slightly silly and short lasting, I think it's probably one of the best straight up upgrades on this list. It's not an attachment or an aesthetic update, but a good old fashioned upgrade of the pre-existing power. And it's Wolverine's primary weapon of choice. So getting to keep using the same old equipment, except now it can heat up to extreme temperatures, that's pretty good. And what makes it even cooler is how the heated claws are formed. When Wolverine is resurrected from death, the excess energy left over from his body's healing process goes into his claws and brings the adamantium to extreme temperatures. Now remember, these claws are made of one of the most durable metals in the universe. So even though heated metal tends to soften, you shouldn't expect his adamantium claws to do the same. These things are driving right into any and every enemy like a hot knife through soft butter. Ew, that's a weird visual. 
But it's true, and not to mention, this dude just came back from the dead. So you can expect him to be pretty angry and ready to take it out on anyone in his way. Okay, at number four is the Iron Spider Suit. Now, this is such a huge upgrade that the word upgrade doesn't even do it justice. Now, if you've seen my list of the top 10 Spider-Man suits, you know that the hero has had many different suits and they are all useful in their own right. But this one is probably the most drastic change that the suit endures in the right direction. Designed by Tony Stark himself, this upgrade changes literally every aspect of the suit for the better. It gets these four spider legs with grips and cameras on the ends of them, allowing the wearer to use them to climb walls hands-free as well as use the cameras to see around corners. He's also got the same internal HUD system as Iron Man's suit, giving him heightened senses using the computer's intel. Not to mention the sophisticated mask system that offers full filtration to keep him from facing a similar fate to Captain Marvel. And a gliding system, giving him more hang time between web swings. It's a huge upgrade to the suit that totally changes the game for Spider-Man and offers him a whole new set of capabilities with which to defend himself and to best all the bad guys. At number three, we've got Iron Man's Hulkbuster suit, which is an insanely powerful upgrade to the typical Iron Man suit, as you can probably already tell by the name. Now, just like Spidey, Iron Man has seen tons of different iterations of his suit. But in this case, this upgrade has a very specific function, to bust the Hulk. To fight the Hulk, yes. The goal is to get the suit to a point where it's ready to take on the Hulk. Otherwise known as Iron Man's Mark 44 armor, this upgrade gives Tony Stark all the tools he needs to take down a bad guy bigger than those he's used to. This thing has a missile launcher, a grappling hook, and something called automatic prehensile propulsion technology, which is basically a function that allows the armor to assemble on its own when it's called upon. And considering the Hulk's impulsive reputation, this feature would probably come in handy if the Hulk suddenly decided he wasn't on Tony's side anymore. On top of all this, he's got the built-in rams, which are used to add that extra oomph to Iron Man's punches. And if he decides that brute force is no use against the green giant, he's also got sleeping gas built into this thing. Although it's not super useful in the movies, this feature will definitely find its benefit at some point down the line if applied properly. At number two are Spider-Man's Web Shooters. I know this is the second Spider-Man upgrade on this list, but it's just a classic upgrade that must be mentioned. I mean, I would even argue that this is the ultimate superhero suit upgrade. And what makes this one really special is that it's the first time we're really shown how much of a scientific genius Peter Parker is. Sure, his character is established on the basis that he's very smart and proficient in biology, but this invention basically allows him to be Spider-Man. Not only does he design the shooters themselves, but he creates the web fluid, which is arguably one of the most useful and durable materials in the world. This list features plenty of upgrades that take an already powerful suit and bring it to a new level, but this entry is an upgrade that turns a guy with superhuman strength and reflexes into, well, Spider-Man. We all know about this one, and it's almost seen as a given at this point, but it really deserves credit for what it really is and was at the time of its creation. A huge step into Spider-Man's career as a superhero. All right, at number one, we have the Batman Justice Buster upgrade, which ranks high on the list because, once again, the word upgrade is a total understatement on this one. I break this one down in more depth than the top 10 Batman suits list, but basically, this suit is designed to take on the Justice League. So every element of this suit has some sort of benefit against each of the members of the Justice League, giving the mortal, Bruce Wayne, an unmatched advantage against any opponents, not just the Justice League. Considering the suit he dons before the Justice Buster is just his typical costume, having a mechanized suit that has processors that work faster than the Flash can move is a pretty big upgrade. And besides the many features specific for taking down the members of the Justice League, this suit just has huge defense stats and attack strength that would help Bruce in any combat situation. 